Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name. Come on, folks. And they're always glad you came. You want to be where people see your troubles are all the same. You want to be where everybody knows your name. You want to go where people know people are all the same. You want to go where everybody knows your name. Yay. Huh? Where is that song from? Yes. Cheers. 1980s. I don't know. Are you, were you guys here in the 1980s? You watching it on Netflix, right? But it was a hit in the 1980s, and that particular theme song was an award-winning theme song. And not just because it was catchy, right? I believe that it became Rolling Stones and TV Guide's best theme song of all time because it hits a very personal note and a very real note with each and every one because it hits on our most basic human need for acceptance. We all want to be where everybody knows our name, right? Okay, I'll come back to that. I'm so happy to be here and back, so glad to be back on campus. I am uh, excited because um, when I was here before, this was a few years back, um, I was able to uh, matriculate through your doctorate program. And when I was in the doctorate program, I had a chance to do my research on Hollywood and how we can effectively minister and serve in entertainment communities like Hollywood. Now, Hollywood wasn't random, right? I didn't just pick that out because it didn't mean anything, right? I actually chose that subject in order to do my research on because I am in Hollywood, right? I've been an actor for as long as I could walk and talk. Um, at the age of, by the age of three, I was in my dancing classes and my acting classes. Um, I am told that my first acting gig was Toto in The Wiz. I barked twice. It was fabulous, <laughs> right? But from a very early age all the way up, my parents saw that God had given me a gift. And it's a gift of expression, right? And how we grew up, because I'm from Augusta, Georgia, any Southern folks in the house? Hey, give me a shout out, Southern folks in the house, right? So coming from a Southern family and coming from a Southern family that was really connected to the church and who were leaders in the church, there was no, there was no splitting up between faith and our gifts, right? There was no one drawing a line and saying, oh, you can't use your dance in church. You can't use your song in church. You can't use acting in church. Like there was no one saying that because within our community and within our church connection, we just did it all. It was a part of who we were, right? So I grew up very much comfortable with the fact that God had given me these creative gifts, these gifts of expression, and for my part, I just didn't feel bad about it. I didn't feel rejected. I didn't feel, I didn't feel like my gifts were not accepted, right? However, in many, Christian circus, cir in many Christian circles, say that fast five times, in many Christian circles, I understand that that's not the case. I understand that many have grown up in situations where their creative gifts were not encouraged and or they were made to be perceived as something that wasn't necessarily good, right? And we'll talk a little bit about that today, right? But I'm grateful that I had a chance to grow up in that environment and then from my middle school to high, high school years, I went to a performing arts uh, school and then as I matriculated and went to college, I was able to uh, major in something that I loved uh, because I got a four-year academic scholarship and could choose whatever I wanted, <laughs> right? right? So I majored in acting because that's what I loved and that's how I saw myself making a living. And the Lord blessed me to do just that, right? While I was also performing in theater and then eventually in television and film, I was also creating my own works, and I had an entire career where I was able to travel all over the world performing these one-woman plays about women of the Bible that I wrote, and as long as I could write it, I could work, 
right? I was one of those people that looked at the lay of the land and I said, hmm, there are limited spaces for people that look like me to work in this industry that I love. So I'm going to keep myself working and I'm going to keep those who look like me working, right? So because I wasn't rejected, because I, no one ever really told me no, I just shoo, went ahead, right? Because no one said, well, Naima, you can't do this, <laughs> and Naima, you can't do that, I just, I just did what was in my heart and mind to do, right? So let's come back to this area of acceptance, this area of rejection, this area of wanting to be where everyone knows our name. In my research, and I'll just touch on it a little bit because, hey, I got it here, right? In my research, I asked a question. I asked, what is the most important need for those that are in the entertainment community, for those in Hollywood? What is the most important need? Let me ask you, what is the most important need of those that are in Hollywood? What is the most important need? Okay, this is like a talk back, um, so I need y'all to talk back to me. If I ask a question, you know, yes, come on. To be seen, right? Yes. To remain relevant. To, to remain relevant, excellent. What else? These are good, yes. Connections and relationship, yes. Money, yes. Yes. Huh? Except, well, just because I said it. <laughs> She's like, I know where you're going. I know where you're going. You're going down this road. I know the answer, right? Most of the time when I was doing my research and I asked people that were not in the industry, I asked, what do you think is the most important need in Hollywood? They said fame, who said to be known? They said fame and fortune. Fame and fortune, right? Most people who were not in the industry said the number one need was fame and fortune. Right? When I asked people, did my research and asked people who were in the industry, people who were just like me, they said to, who said to be relevant, right? They said, I want, my most important need is to make a difference. I want my artistry to move and make a difference in people's lives, right? But then I asked the shepherds. I asked the leaders. I had a chance to interview the pastors who for 15 to 30 years had been shepherding artists in Hollywood. And these were all mega churches, but I had a chance to, to interview each one. And the pastors of, of the entertainers, the pastors of those in Hollywood, they all said that the number one need for those that are in the community and in a community that is like an entertainment community, the number one need is acceptance, acceptance. Oxford defines acceptance as the process of being received as adequate. The process of being received as adequate. And as I thought about that, I thought, you know what? I don't know that that's just Hollywood. Isn't that a fundamental need for all of us? Don't we all want to be received as adequate? Don't we all want safe spaces where Everybody knows our name and it feels like we can just be us. Don't you just feel better when you walk in the room and you don't have to have on a mask, you can let your hair down or up or however which way you, your hair is going, right? <laughs> do whatever you want to do. But you can just be you. Who wants to have to be somebody else all the time in order to be accepted, right? So number one need, number one need, acceptance. So this picture that you see that is already up, right? Yes, this picture that you see, thank you, Rose. This picture happened one day when I was walking in my hood, right? My hood, I'm in Beverly Hills, right? <laughs> it's my hood, it is, hey! It's my hood, this is where I walk, right? And I bring this up, <laughs> I know, that's funny. Um, I bring this up because this particular session is about Jesus in Hollywood. This conference is about incarnate. This is about us discussing what it looks like for Jesus to put on flesh 
and walk in this world, right? And so if Jesus puts on flesh and walks in this world and, and he provides every need and the greatest need of a community like Hollywood and Beverly Hills is acceptance, then I don't see Jesus running around rejecting everybody, right? But this is what I saw on my way to the grocery store, right? I had been in Beverly Hills for about two years and, um, and I walked everywhere, right? So daily walk. At the time, I was still uh, doing my, my entertainment thing, my acting thing and producing thing. And so, um, you know, you got to stay in shape. And it's beautiful in L.A., right? Y'all decided to come to school at Biola. You could have gone to Canada, right? Not, nothing against Canada. All my, my Canadians in the house and nothing against, right? But you chose sunny California, right? So I'm walking. And what do you see? What do you see? Come on, come on, talk to me. This is a breakout, right? Come on, talk to me. What do you see? Right? Sign says, fear God. What else? Right? One said, repent. <laughs> Turn. Right? Turn from evil. Right? This is what I saw when I'm walking to pavilions. Right? It's at the corner. If you guys are familiar with the area, it's at the corner of Olympic and Beverly Drive. This is what I see. So... I come around the corner and I am mortified, right? Mortified because this is my hood and some of my fellow Christian brothers and sisters have come in my hood with some signs basically telling the folks that yearn for acceptance, we reject you. And they literally like, they stand it. I mean, they, they ready, right? <laughs> now, mind you, my hood wasn't necessarily accepting them. So the hood, where people were going by, blowing horns, uh, saying not so nice things, Caleb. They were, they were going by and saying all kinds of things, right? And you would have thought it was World War III on the corner of pavilion, and you know, in front of the pavilions. People just trying to go in and get some bagels and cream cheese. And you got... You got a fight going on outside, <laughs> right? But here's what happened, here's what happened. I walked up and said, who's in charge, right? And the picketers pointed me to the person in charge. And I walked up to the person in charge and introduced myself and he seemed so relieved. Oh goodness, another Christian and another Christian leader. Yes, we've been suffering for Jesus out here on the corner. People are blowing and shouting and we're just, we're, you know, we're doing, we're doing our best to hold it down for the kingdom. I said, do you know anybody here? No, we don't know anyone. We, we drove from 45 miles away. I said, did you talk to anybody before you came? Talk to any other Christian leaders in the community before you came? No, we're doing this for the Lord. I said, great, can you pack it up? <laughs> he laughed too. He thought it was funny. I'm like, no, 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 seriously. Can you pack this up? Because right now you are undoing two years of love that my husband has sold into this city. By you being on this block with those signs, you are undoing two years of relationships that we've been building. You see, you see that building right there a block from here? That's where our church plant meets, right there. And right down this street right here, that's where I live. So this whole block, I'm responsible for this whole block, and I've been loving on all these folks. When I walk to the post office, I'm loving on the folks at the post office. When I walk, I know who my neighbors are. I know what the who the restaurant owners are. I know who the homeless people are. I Listen, up and down this block, I know who the police officer are, officers are, where this is their be like I know this place and they all know that I represent God so when you come with signs saying you there's something wrong with you there's something wrong with you there's something wrong with you and you haven't even taken a, the time to even ask what we're doing you haven't taken the time to get to know anybody you haven't taken the time you are unraveling all of our love can you pack this up? Right? So it's a little bit contentious, right? 
you know, Valerie, I'm not fighting on the streets of Beverly Hills, right? My husband let me know that, you know, unless it's some Martin Luther King stuff, if I go to jail, he's not going to come get me. <laughs> and if you know my husband, you know he's telling the truth. 6'2", brother, real cool, real fine. Y'all would love Kevin. Y'all would love him. But he's serious. Yeah, he's serious, right? So I, I think about that. You know, you got to have proper motivation, right? Can't be fighting in the streets of Beverly Hills because my husband's not going to come get me, right? But at the end of the day, what I, what I tried to articulate was, and this is where I think he finally understood, I said, if I got in my van with a big Bible and a scripture on it, right? And that's what they had. They had a huge van parked out front. If I got in a van like that, and I got my posse that looks like me, and we rolled up in your neighborhood in the suburbs 45 miles away with our picket signs, and we started marching around your streets in front of your children's school, in front of your grocery store, how would you feel? One, First of all, you probably call the police. <laughs> that would very, we would be prepared to go to jail. Because if we showed up in your neighborhood without picket signs, y'all gonna lock us up. And depending on the neighborhood, we may not make it back. Right? So this, this becomes life and death. No one's gonna hurt you here, but in the spirit, you're doing irreparable damage. Please go. You know, he has something to chew on. They didn't move immediately. He thought he was right. I just prayed, you know. And then I just said, hey, in the future, if you choose to go to another neighborhood, first of all, take care of your own neighborhood, right? Because I know you wouldn't do this in your neighborhood. You wouldn't, you wouldn't walk around your neighborhood with picket signs where you live. You're not doing this, right? Because <laughs> that would be too much like Jesus to, to love on the folk in your neighborhood. Right, right. Right? Right? But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, I said, in the future, just reach out. Reach out to the neighborhoods. Reach out to the cities. Reach out to the leaders who are sowing into the cities before you go. Because in this particular city, this doesn't work. Right? You can take it down. It doesn't work. Right? So what works? I'm glad you asked. Can we turn to the scripture? Can we see what Jesus did? Turn to Luke 5. Turn to Luke 5. Turn to Luke 5. Let's see what Jesus did. Because this is the, 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 this is the, 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 the role model that we want to follow. Jesus himself. Luke chapter 5. Pull up verse 27. Luke 5, 27. Right? Can you pull it up for me? Luke 5, 27. Let's check out what does Jesus do if he was in Hollywood. Let's check it out. After that, he, Jesus, and after that meaning he's already called uh, Peter and James and John. He's healed a paralytic. He's healed a leper. So after all of that, he, Jesus, went out and noticed a tax collector named Levi, that's Matthew, sitting in a tax booth. And he said to him, follow me, right? What does Jesus do? Jesus approaches one who would be considered an outcast, right? Because who likes the tax man? Anybody, anybody love your tax man? Anybody love the IRS in the house? Can I get some love for the IRS? Can I get... <laughs> <laughs> can I get some love for the folks taking taxes out of your check? Can I get some love for the tax? No love? Ain't no love for the tax guy? Okay, fine. All right? <laughs> but Jesus, Jesus is not, Jesus is not, Jesus is not one who rejects the outcast, right? He goes up to Matthew and says, follow me. And this was so compelling because verse 28 says, and he, Matthew, left everything behind and got up and began to follow him. Two words, follow me, and the man left his job. That's got to be some kind of invitation, right? Left, left everything, says he left it all. Jesus, two words, invitation, follow me, and he left it all. That would be the equivalent of Jesus rolling up on the set 
What, what movie's out now? Gemini Man? Where, where did Will Smith? Anybody see that? Gemini Man, right? Did you see it? Oh, the Joker. Ah, oh, right, Joker. See, I don't know where they filmed Joker. I know where they filmed um, Gemini Man. Where did they film Joker? Okay, great. All right. So, which one would you like? Which example would you like me to use? Do we have a Do we have a choice? Do we have a We have a preference. Gemini man or Joker? Gemini man, Joker. 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 All right. Yes, Joker. Gemini man. Gemini man. Can I get some consensus in the house? Joker. That would be the equivalent. <laughs> That would be the equivalent, right? That would be the equivalent of Jesus rolling up on the set of Joker, rolling up on the set of Joker and saying, hey, follow me. And the cast drops everything and walks off the set. Can we, can we, can we just imagine what that, can we imagine what that looks like? This is what happens with Matthew. Jesus says, follow me, he leaves. But not only that, hey, verse 29. Matthew gave, what, a big reception for him in his house, and there was a great crowd of tax collectors and other people who were reclining at the table with them. Not only does Matthew leave his job, he throws a party. Hey, ho, hey, ho. He's like, apparently he wasn't wasn't concerned about money, right? Apparently, he, apparently he, had, he had what he needed because he left his job and was like, peace, I'm out. I guess the IRS was not treating him well. <laughs> peace. <laughs> I'm following Jesus now and I'm throwing a party and inviting all of my other outcast friends. Right? And you would think, hey, you would think this is great. But guess what? Verse 30, the Pharisees, the religious folk, the church, us, we, us, we, us, we, us. Pharisees and their scribes began grumbling at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with the outcasts? Why are you eating and drinking with the tax collectors and sinners? Right? Why are you hanging with the outcasts, Jesus? You're supposed to be religious. You're supposed to be a religious leader. You're supposed to be the teacher. Why are you hanging with the outcasts? What does Jesus say? Jesus answered, It is not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Can we talk? How does Jesus call to repentance? What did he do? He invited into relationship. He partied with. He went down, plopped down in the middle of the center of the party. He's eating and drinking and having a good time. Right? And he says, by my very presence, I'm here because these are the folk that need me. And as I hang with them, I call them to repentance. And we see just in the, in the beginning of this chapter, if you just flip a page and go back to the beginning of that very chapter five, you see when he calls Simon Peter, right? When he calls Simon Peter, he performs a miracle, a miracle having to do with his work, a miracle having to do with their finances. Jesus blessed their socks off. And when he blesses their socks off, five, eight, Peter replies, But when Simon Peter saw this, the miracle, he fell down at Jesus' feet saying, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. The response to Jesus' miracle is worship and repentance. Jesus went walking around with a picket sign telling folks how bad they are. He says, come, roll with me. Come, follow me. And when you see what I do, the revelation comes upon you that I am who I am, God in the flesh. And that's with that revelation, that's when we go, oh, Lord, forgive me. I'm a sinful man. Right? 
My point today, you don't take anyone, anything else from this. My point today is that as Jesus incarnates and puts on flesh, when he decides to walk around in the world and call people to repentance, he does it through invitation into relationship, and he does it in such a way that people know that they are loved and accepted. And if we, his kids, if we, his family, if we, his church, if we, the bride, because we're the bride, right? We're the bride, fabulous bride. We, the bride, are to follow him and to do what he does, then when we put on flesh and walk in this world, guess what? We invite into relationship, and we make sure that people know that they are loved and accepted. Right? This is what we do in Hollywood. This is what we do in Beverly Hills. We love on folks. Now, okay, I hear you, I hear you, because there's somebody in the room, and this is what happened in my own doctoral research. You know, I have folks, I got a little pushback. They were like, but that just sounds like an invitation to sin. Sounds like you're just saying, everybody just do whatever. Right? What did Je I just go back to what did Jesus do? He spoke the truth. Sound like to me, the only people he, were calling, he was calling out was the religious folk. <laughs> You know, he was partying with Matthew and the tax collectors. He sat down in the middle like, hey, what's up? I'm here. I'm in the house. Right? There's something in that where he loves on folks. And I say, that's what we do too. Now, are we honest? Do we tell the truth? Absolutely. But here's what I believe because the scripture said it. The Holy Spirit is the one who convicts of sin. Right? If I'm walking in relationship with you and we're walking and we are both trying to follow Jesus, the Holy Spirit is the one who will convict of sin. Right? Does that mean every now and then in leadership I have to make some points and I have to point out some blind spots? Yes. But I only do that if I am directed by the Lord. But most of the time we're just doing relationships just like Jesus did. Right? We're doing relationships just like he did. Right? When we look at and ask the question, how can we, how can we put on flesh? How can we walk this out? How can we love? I want to ask you a very simple question. How did Jesus woo you? How did Jesus, how did Jesus woo you? Was it a a chase you down and smother you with smother you with love. Was it a? Did you play hard to get? Yeah, I know some of y'all. Some of y'all know you. Some of y'all you playing hard to get. Some of you played hard to get. I know you did. You still playing hard to get. I'm with you. I'm not. I'm with you. I'm not. <laughs> I'm with you, Jesus. Nah, not today. Not today. How did he woo you? Did he beat you over the head with a picket sign? <laughs> Did he put a neon light out? Sinner, sinner, sinner. Repent, repent, repent. Fear me, fear me. <laughs> right? You got to ask, does this stuff work? <laughs> does it work? I love us. See, this is the thing. I, listen, we're having a little family meeting, right? Because I love, I love, I love the church. I love God's family. I'm in love, still in love with God, and I love, love, love his family, right? And I also love Hollywood because Hollywood's my family, and I love creative folks, Right? And God loves creative folks, because guess what? He's a creator. There's a reason why Hollywood is shaping our entire world. And let me tell you this, Hollywood gets some stuff right. Let's look at the top. <laughs> okay. 
we are, we are almost done. We're gonna look at the top selling films of all times. What's number one? This is worldwide, 2.7 billion and counting. Avengers Endgame is the number one selling movie of all time. Guess what happens in Endgame? There's a lead character that gives up his life for the people that he loves. Am I right? Am I right? Conquers evil. Conquers evil by giving up, by sacrificing his life for the people he loves. Am I right? Come on now. What's number two? Avatar. Right? Guess what happens in Avatar? Anybody? We have a lead character that's willing to what? Give up his life for the people he loves. See where we're going with this? What's number three? Titanic. Titanic. Same director as number two. Right, same director. What happens in Titanic? <laughs> what happens? What happens? What happens, people? Main character who gives up his life Right? For the woman that he loves. Now, between me and you, between me and you, if I'm Rose, that was her name, right? Her name was Rose, right? Between me and you, if I was Rose, <laughs> Leo was not, I know his name wasn't Leo, but I'm, you know, Leo. Jack. 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 Y'all don't want to go to the movies with me. Y'all go to the movies with me. I'm calling everybody by their real name. And Black Panther, I was like, Chad! Right, so Jack, we'll, we'll, use, we'll use Jack. Listen, if I'm Rose and Jack, I'm, I'm, t I'm saying to Jack, brother, you're gonna have to hold on here. There's enough space for both of us. You don't have to fall. Come on, come on, Rose. Come on, help that brother out. You, ain't, you are not going down in this water. Hey, here, you let, wake up, Jack, come on. <laughs> don't die on me. Number four, number four, right? Yeah. Right? Star Wars, Force Awakens. Did we hear some boots? Y'all don't, like, don't like Star Wars? Okay, Star Wars, Force Awakens. What happens in Force Awakens? Uh, Harrison, Ford. Harrison Ford. Han Solo, I'm sorry. Gives up his life. Come on, come, come on, come on. Do you see, do you see? Listen, these are the top selling movies of all time, right? Black Panther, now this is domestic, number four domestic, number four domestic, right? That's what the D is for, domestic. Did we see a resurrection? Did we see a, a death and a resurrection, right? Right? A king willing to give his, Come on, people. All right, so number seven, Lion King, what happens? And mind you, five and six are there too, but you know, they're, they're like Avengers movies, so we already got the Avenger theme, right? I wanted to throw in, just you know, throw in another Disney. What happens in Lion King? Okay, my point, my point as I close. Yes, Mufasa gives his life. My point as I close is that Hollywood gets, Hollywood gets it. We don't have to use our words and our actions to reject our brothers and sisters who are creative. And it's not just Hollywood. Hollywood, I'm using that as a metaphor today of everyone that's considered outcast and other, right? Anyone that doesn't look like you, anyone who's not in your sphere, anyone that you look at and go, uh, Right? Instead of judgment and criticism, instead of picket sign evangelism, can we roll up our sleeves like Jesus did? Can we extend an invitation into relationship? 
And can we make sure that people know that they are loved and accepted? Because that's what Jesus did with us. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.